Star Fox is more erratic than any other popular Nintendo franchise. And that's kind of saying a lot, because Mario is consistently jumping between platformers, kart races, sports games, and even playing Doctor, but still manages to feel more consistent in tone. Where Mario's divergences feel natural within his weird collective universe of games, Star Fox has failed to craft its own identity in the gaming space. The series has become a testing grounds of Nintendo's current innovations, whether it be in the form of the Super FX chip allowing 3D on the SNES, or touch and motion controls with the DS and Wii U respectively. This has left most titles feeling impressive at the time, but inevitably falling by the wayside once more refined games came along, and made progress with the tech at hand. This has led to the series becoming, for lack of a better term, a huge fucking mess. Nintendo have backed themselves into an unfortunate corner with Star Fox, and time has not been kind to the series save for the Nintendo 64 outing. From rail shooters to 3D Zelda clones and some weird mixes in between, Fox has been through a lot in his relatively short span of six titles. The crux of the problem comes from trying to define what constitutes a Star Fox game. You'd think this would be a relatively simple exercise for such a storied franchise, but given Super Smash Bros is the most consistent thing Fox McCloud has been a part of, appearing in all four games with solid continuity of his character. The short answer to this question is an on-rail shooter with a squad of four anthropomorphic animals, made up of Fox, Falco, Peppy, and Slippy. But only the first game completely embodies this philosophy. Having been passed around different developers such as Nintendo EAD, Namco, Q Games, and even Platinum, each one putting their own spin on what they considered to be a Star Fox game, with each trying wildly different things. There's no definable series trajectory to keep track of. This series inconsistency is a pretty deep-rooted problem with Star Fox, and why Nintendo fails to find its footing constantly when putting out new titles. And in order to understand this, I think it's time we swallow the pill and realize that the Star Fox series overall just isn't as good as we remember it. I'm not here to dismiss anyone's fun. If you enjoy any or all of the games, that's fantastic. I just want to point out some flaws with a series that many people claim to love, but doesn't sell well and isn't built on a solid foundation of consistency. Star Fox 64 may be my favorite game of all time, and I know I'm not alone in thinking that. Many would argue that 64, unlike other members of its relatively small family, stands up incredibly well to modern day criticisms. However, that really can't be said about any other game in the franchise. I think you'd be hard pressed to find many people who rate a different Star Fox game as highly. Even Star Fox Zero, the Wii U's installment, fails to stand out with that console's unfortunately small library. In a series built on remakes and reboots, it's hard for any Star Fox game to make its mark in gaming culture without being compared to 64 in one way or another. It's either a retreading of old ground or something that's deviated so far from the path it doesn't resemble what the franchise should be. With this video, I want it to be clear I'm not attacking Star Fox, just bringing to light the potential that has perhaps been lost in a sea of failed experiments. Through this, hopefully we can begin to define some kind of direction the series should take if there is to be another installment. So with that, I'm going to try and dissect how one of Nintendo's flagship franchises lost its way, or if it even had a sense of direction to begin with. Nintendo has always been obsessed with pushing fancy new technology into Star Fox by any means necessary, with the only possible exceptions being the GameCube outings Adventures and Assault. The first big selling point of Star Fox back in 1993 was its incredible tech, managing to pull off impressive 3D models on the 16-bit console. Sure, you could say Donkey Kong beat Fox to the punch, but unlike the Kong's 3D models converted into sprites, this was fully functioning polygons in a 2D space. With this success, a sequel was quickly put into production, a sequel that was to feature a dynamically changed changing map, more vehicles, and six playable characters. And it also was to be the introduction of the villainous mercenary team Starwolf. Unfortunately, as the game was doing its rounds on showroom floors and building hype, at an estimated 95% completion, Nintendo pulled the plug and outright cancelled Star Fox 2. Not wanting to put out a game on an old console, seeing as the competition already had 3D capable machines, and Nintendo was about to release the Nintendo 64. This is kind of the first step in technology over gameplay. By the time the Nintendo 64 rolled around, 3D was no longer a selling point. It had become a staple for home consoles. So in order to push units of the next iteration, Nintendo decided to package the game with a rumble pack for the controller, making Star Fox 64 the first ever game to have a rumble feature. Is the rumble pack. The big reason why Star Fox 64 is the coolest cinematic gaming experience there is. <laughs> 
And this gimmick worked incredibly well, selling just over 4 million units, outselling the next best game in the series by 2 million. Nintendo pushed Rumble technology into other games later down the line, such as GoldenEye and Ocarina of Time, so it made sense to grab the pack with Star Fox 64. Sony didn't release the DualShock until 1998, so while Rumble and controllers has become an overlooked standard feature of modern technology, back in 1997, there was a brief period where only one game had the ability to give physical feedback, and that's a pretty big deal. It's hard to say if the Rumble pack is the sole reason for the success of 64, but it definitely helped expose new gamers to the series. If this hadn't have happened, there is a very high chance Star Fox would have remained a niche title and kept untouched for future games further down the line. With Star Fox Command and Zero, Nintendo decided to push their fancy new console technology harder than any other core franchise, with the DS and Wii U respectively. Both games feature mandatory control schemes that revolve entirely around the DS's touchpad and the Wii U's second screen and motion sensor abilities. While Nintendo's attempt to prove their worth of their technology is incredibly admirable, this compulsory nature leaves a bitter taste with both games, and leaves them considerably weaker than they should have been as a result. So let's start with Command. Having an almost completely stylish controlled shooter in itself is a pretty weird sell. Overall, it is a mixed bag of clashing gameplay ideas, a lot of which were carried over from the cancelled Star Fox 2. Command is a hybrid of turn-based tactics gameplay, similar to that of Advance Wars, and it actually works coherently with the style of setup of the DS. You have an overmap and move Fox and his crew around to intercept enemy ships, and complete the objective in a set number of turns, using different members of the crew to do so. The stylus is also used to rub away the fog of war in small increments each turn to get a better view of the battlefield. If this was fleshed out to further replicate the tactics genre, it could have been one of the strongest titles in the entire series, as Nintendo has an incredibly good history with these kinds of games. Unfortunately, being a Star Fox game, space shoot em up battles needed to be here. And this is where Command really falls apart. With the exception of the L shoulder button to fire off lasers, the game is entirely controlled by touchscreen. If you want to move around, pull off somersaults, barrel rolls, or U-turns, it's all by specific swipes of the stylus, leaving tense combat moments ruined by accidentally doing a flip when you really just wanted to turn left to get a better view of the enemy. Gone also are the on-rail sections. Command's combat is dictated entirely by all range mode. On top of this, each map also has a time limit to beat or you're booted back to the overview screen to try again. It only serves to make each failure that much more devastating. Overall, the game is a nightmare of conflicting ideals that really has a strain on the wrist, trying to nail perfect maneuvers in a very strict time limit. Zero's control schemes present a lot of the same problems that Command did. In yet another attempt to innovate the series, Nintendo brought forward full motion control. The control scheme can be slightly altered, but there are still aspects of tilt control that are completely mandatory. And unlike a lot of its console contemporaries, Zero requires full use of the gamepad and TV at the same time. The biggest reason for including this gamepad cockpit view is for precision aiming. If you fly over an enemy and miss the kill, you can tilt the gamepad downward to get those last shots in before being forced forward. In theory, this is a great idea. Precision aiming and getting last minute shots in should be a welcome introduction to the Star Fox formula, but in practice there is still a lot of micromanaging between the two screens. Even though it's a slight hindrance on the on-rails sections, the extra visibility can come in handy. Where it fails to meet expectations, however, is the all-range sections. A lot of the time, the TV camera will either automatically or at least heavily require the use of locking onto a key occurrence, meaning you're stuck trying to look at two different screens at the same time, and it just becomes an overbearing headache. With this motion technology, it's incredibly surprising Nintendo didn't push a Wii-centric title, because there is some value to the tilt controls. But with the way the two screens are handled, a lot of the good design got lost in the mix. I'm going to be dividing the six Star Fox games into two categories. I'm not sure if there is an official or fan accepted name for these two groups, but I'll be going with the Remake Trilogy, which is the SNES, Nintendo 64, and Wii U versions, and then the Reboot Trilogy, which is Adventures, Assault, and Command. So let's start with the remakes. Both 64 and Zero are heavily influenced not only by the original SNES title, but also the unreleased sequel Star Fox 2. In both Vehicle Variety, the additional rival mercenary team Star Wolf, and the All Range Mode, all three games use the idea of starting at the Homeworld Corn area and end with the final showdown with the big bad guy Andros on Venom, and have incredibly short run times, ranging from 45 minutes to about 2 hours depending on your skill level and the routes you choose to take. The original Star Fox managed to pull off some pretty unique design despite the game's short length. 
there's three paths to choose that essentially boil down to easy, medium, and hard mode, containing different levels and even different layouts of the starting world con area, which was a pretty big deal for its time. Giving a difficulty that meant more than just tuned up baddies that dealt more damage was unprecedented and remains to this day a fairly unused concept in the larger scheme of game design. All said the game would not take longer than an hour to complete if you're skilled enough. And during the time of the SNES, the idea of games extending their life through incredible difficulty was still a novel idea that many were okay with. While it hasn't aged particularly gracefully, back then it effectively established its own identity, from which many subsequent games would take influence. The original is a good way to get your bearings on how it all started and where every other game takes its, even if tiny, influence from. The different paths, squad mate back and forth banter, and level design are all here, if but in their most primitive state. While Star Fox has never really had any level design to truly write home about, it does one key thing right, and that is giving players their moment to breathe. For every intense dogfight you encounter, there's always a quick moment of reprieve to catch some air before continuing forward, and this small detail helps with every single remake trilogy's key focus on replayability, not only helping in the heat of the moment to catch a break, but also never becoming overbearing that hitting start on Corneria again and again will feel daunting. A lot of what made 64 fantastic can be found in the finer details, and as a result remains pretty understated, with its approach to high scores being used as a mechanic that could help players master levels. After reaching a certain kill count on each stage the counter turns red, and if all teammates are alive, a medal is given out, a sign that you have truly mastered the stage, gain a medal on all stages and a hard mode is unlocked, further pushing the player to test themselves on what they know framing difficulty in this cool way of displaying a not chosen but earned attitude, acting as an early days new game plus, given out for those that were truly worthy. Full voice acting was also implemented, a first for any Nintendo franchise. Come on, Fox! Let's kick some tail! A feature that to this day Nintendo hesitates to add to its IPs. This gave Dogfight some much needed audible banter between squad mates as well as helping sell the rivalry of Star Wolf, as they taunted and downright tormented Fox about his deceased father. This rivalry made every encounter with them a controller gripping affair as you furiously tried to blast them down. What kept players coming back were the little challenges along the way that had players thinking outside the box like flying under all the rings in Corneria after helping Falco stay alive to open up the secret path disabling all the spotlights on Zonus to reach the boss undetected, or that eerie music shift when the Sector X boss comes back to life, and you have to kill him before he knocks Slippy down to Titania. In turn, this led to metal mastery by having players learn levels inside and out to gain a reward. Again, it's subtle choices like these that made Star Fox what it was, and it helped the first two titles stand out as must-have games for their respective consoles. And if you'd like a deeper breakdown on why the metal system in Star Fox 64 works well, check out my video on the subject. What Star Fox Zero loses in terms of its overall design is the subtlety that 64 hit on the head so perfectly. For example, remember that little Falco moment that rewarded players by having them pay attention to what squad mates had to say? Well, that secret path is here again, but in the form of a big red button you press by transforming your ship after you unlock the chicken walker. Meaning you have to do Corneria at least once and can't accidentally stumble upon this cool secret. This example is a small but important look at how Zero misses the mark on what made the previous game such a beloved smash hit. The story mode lets players pick and choose whichever level they want to play at any given time. Granted, they have already unlocked the correct pathway there. It's a shame they dropped the traditional arcade mode as the default way to play and relegated it to an unlockable, but given that the current game climate has moved far beyond traditional arcade shooters, it does make sense. Medals do make a return, but in the form of multiple collectibles on each stage, either as a reward for killing a certain number of enemies like before, or finding them hidden on each level. This new way of finding medals is fantastic for rewarding replayability and encouraging different approaches to each stage, but falls flat when the only reward is a different skin for Fox's ship, which you can get with Amiibo, and the addition of a more traditional arcade mode. Structurally, Zero is incredibly solid, falling just shy of what came before it. It's just a shame the controls really bring the entire experience down a lot further than that. The sins of Star Fox 64 being a remake are often overlooked due to how good it is and how well it has held up over time, but it did set in motion the trend of a great identity crisis. While the remake trilogy is the most consistent of the two lots of games, it still feels very lost, but being able to successfully move past this formula might be the right step for Star Fox. Star Fox Adventures on the GameCube marked Nintendo's first massive reboot of the franchise. It also led to there being the first proper sequels to the series introduced with Assault and Command, creating a through line for all the games plot-wise, despite their game mechanics being very different. The complete overarching plot isn't exactly strong, and it feels like the games were rushed to be tied together in some way or another, but it's still a significant step forward, which says a lot about how long it took Star Fox to get off the ground to try and make it as a proper series. This time in the series life cycle illustrates when Nintendo tried to copy trends of the gaming landscape with not only the aforementioned 3D Zelda clone, but also a third-person shooter. 
Unfortunately, this new generation came with one of Nintendo's biggest losses, the second party development powerhouse Rare, using Adventures as their swan song title for the big end before being sold off and purchased as an in-house developer for Microsoft. It started its life cycle as a would-be new property from Rare titled Dinosaur Planet, which involved two main protagonists, Saber and Crystal. In a move whose details are merely rumored at this point, Dinosaur Planet was switched to Star Fox Adventures, disappointing many of the team who had grown attached to their new IP. My theory here is Miyamoto saw that Dinosaur Planet was actually just a bland clone, and given Rare's decline in quality over the recent years, thought the Star Fox brand might help sell copies. This move involved replacing Saber with Fox McCloud, as well as a near complete rewrite of the entire story to accommodate for such a drastic change, bringing the series into a strange new territory for its third official release, mimicking the success of what was popular in a post Ocarina of Time landscape. Time has not been kind to adventures however, and the cracks that come with shifting gears of production on a game halfway through its development cycle began to show many years down the line. These last minute changes left adventures feeling half finished, the owing sections are empty and offer no challenge, instead taking the role as padding as well as attempting to find that lost Star Fox feeling that should have been there. The biggest flaw Adventures has comes with instead having the big long awaited showdown with the game's main villain be replaced with Andros returning out of nowhere to be the real bad guy, leaving any and all tension with general Scales up to dry. This is so badly ham fisted in, Scales won't even attack the player in the arena, and the cutscene to move forward is only triggered once players pull out their staff to attack. This all may have been forgivable if the dungeon design was more up to standard with its colleagues. If you have followed Mark Brown's boss key series, he highlights a key point about the dungeon design in Zelda games, which is that in order to have an engaging dungeon, it must be full of fun micro challenges, as well as have a solid overall puzzle that requires the sum of every part to be solved. Here though, the dungeons just lock things behind basic enemy encounters and pressing switches to move forward until you've run through enough of the hoops and reached the boss. Assault had Namco give their own take on a Star Fox game, bringing with them a mix of land-based and flight combat, set up in a very strict linear mission-based structure with standard R-Wing sections as well as on-foot missions which sometimes feature the use of the Landmaster, the series' titular tank vehicle. So Assault does offer some diversity with this design structure, but restraining missions like this loses a lot of the feeling that gave those earlier Star Fox games its unique edge. Medals can be gained on every stage just like 64, but there's no expression in how you get to the final showdown based on how you want or how well you do. There is nothing inherently wrong with the linear mission based structure, it just doesn't feel very in line with what the series had been known to do best originally, especially with a strong focus on R-Wing space flights in this iteration. Assault has the strongest mechanical setup for its flying, maneuverability feels good and shooting is satisfying, but the level design comes up short in some places. Unlike in the reboot trilogy, there is no room to breathe with these sections, enemies are on constant attack and in very large numbers, meaning there is a lot to manage with objectives and trying to keep fellow teammates alive. This all becomes very overwhelming pretty quickly, and the fellow member's safety falls by the wayside. Not that it is as important in Star Fox 64, where if you manage to have all teammates alive by the end of the stage and got a certain kill count, you would be awarded a medal. That system remains intact, but much more minimally and with less effect. The reward for getting all medals outside of bragging rights is just simply unlocking Wolf in multiplayer mode, losing that sense of understated depth that 64 managed to get so right. Finally, Command rounds out this trio, with its turn-based tactics and all-range mode hybrid. Unlike the previous two, its goal wasn't to replicate a genre that was popular at the time, instead it took notes from the up-and-coming trend of choice-based story paths. Being very akin to visual novels in its storytelling, the choices you make when starting or finishing a mission to progress dictate different options that will appear on your journey. Personally, this is something I love about Command, and may be one of the few things I pulled enjoyment out of. And it's interesting this was to be the end of this little trilogy, given the game's total of 9 endings that can be attained, capping it off in a way you'd like to see as canonical, which is honestly a nice little touch. Despite some of the endings being very questionable at best. All of the reboot trilogy games are at incredible odds with one another, mishmashing very different gameplay styles and mechanics in a series of only three games, while simultaneously continuing to attempt to tell a messy but nonetheless overarching story, may be the biggest defender of why Star Fox has a very mixed fanbase and has grown to have incredibly minimal consistency over time. So with all of that said, how can Star Fox go forward if Nintendo decide to greenlight another game? No matter what, it will be a contested choice given how rocky the foundations of remakes and reboots the series has been built upon. Making another game like those in the remake trilogy are hard to sell, with a very short time to complete, no matter how dense the experience secretly is under the hood, it's a hard sell at full retail price. And going with yet another reboot to restart Fox and the gang with a new set of gameplay styles would be disheartening to a lot of the diehard fans who love the arcade style. It's a franchise that is stuck with a divided fan base. Personally, I believe Nintendo should completely retool what a Star Fox game is. 
ditch any notion of R-Wings, bring Platinum back on board and take the series in a Bayonetta Vanquish-like direction that focuses on Fox and his blaster. Maybe bring in older stylistic choices like Slippy being able to show a big bad boss's health bar and have Peppy act as intel for your situations. And Falco, well, Falco could be another playable character that's faster, but not as strong as Fox to have variance in gameplay approaches and even pull some influence from Smash Bros there. This complete ditch of R-Wings and space combat might be a shock to the system, but getting rid of the unnecessary fan service might be just enough to get the blood pumping through the veins of old fans and maybe draw in some new ones. Regardless of the direction Nintendo decide to take, I really hope they drop the notion of forcing Star Fox to be their show pony for technology and focus again on what made the original games great. Surprising depth and great replayability. Thank you for watching this video. Um, this thing took fucking ages to do. I've been working on it since April, trying to play these six games. Most of them are shit. So trying to get through them all was a fucking nightmare. I just want to give some thanks to some people that really helped me out with this. Um, Hamish Black from Writing on Games and The Resbutin of Resbutin YouTube Show. Um, they saw me through m many rewrites, lots of pages, thousands of words. Without them, the script wouldn't have a coherent structure. Well, at least I thought it was coherent, like it does now. Um, the old form was fucking shit and messy and whatever. Nick of Nikolai Bolton, formerly Feral Panda, um, he sent me Star Fox Zero and Star Fox Adventures to play. Man, I'm swearing a lot, I'm sorry. Bella at Miss Sims, I'm on Twitter. Um, she lent me her Elgato so I could actually capture the footage which was fucking great. <sighs> yeah, Bella does dope art, so go follow her on Twitter if you want to see some cool shit. She actually did my avatar thing here on YouTube, so check her out. Lastly, I just want to say thank you to the patrons. Without those guys, I wouldn't have had the drive to finish this video as quickly as I did. I know it's been a month since my last upload, but honestly, it would have been way longer without that push that their support gave me to finally get this fucking thing out. Um, and yeah, hopefully you enjoyed it. Uh, I don't know how to end this, so cheers.